all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. Yeah! It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, if something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, I'm Bob Clearmountain, and I'm happy to be with you. I was the mixer on Forgiven, Not Forgotten, and you're listening to Chorus Cast. Thanks for joining me, and welcome again to now episode nine of Chorus Cast. Um, it's been so incredible to have the feedback from the previous episodes, and I'm really excited to share this next episode with you uh, as we go and delve deeper into the music side of the record, specifically mixing. In this episode, we speak with the Grammy and Emmy award-winning record engineer, mixer and record producer, Bob Clearmountain. With a career spanning four decades and working with artists such as uh, David Bowie, Bruce Springsteen, the Rolling Stones, Toto, Bon Jovi, and his close friend, Brian Adams. It's such an honor to be able to speak to this legend of the music industry regarding mixing Forgiven Not Forgotten. After a lot of organizing and patience and persistence, uh, I finally caught up with Bob and was able to interview him and discuss with him how he came to be working on the core's first album, Forgiven Not Forgotten. Join me as I began by asking him how his journey in the music industry all began. Enjoy. I'd been asking the guests how they got to where they were when they were then asked to work with the cause on this album. So your background to how are you how did you get to the point where you're now mixing the first Cause album? Your background, for those that may not know your work prior to listening to this, simply because they're only just a Cause fan. Right. Well, I mean, in a nutshell, I started as, as a recording engineer in New York City in a studio called Media Sound. I mean, the, the band, I was in a band, I was a bass player, and the band I was in broke up, and I started hanging around the studio where we were doing a demo till they... I kept bugging them until they finally hired me. And um, I was an assistant engineer for a number of years. I worked with, with um, we mostly did R&B records. Well, they did the jingles in the, during the daytime, mm. mostly. And so I was an assistant engineer. We did a lot of R&B records like Cool and the Gang, which is one of the first things that I ever worked on or recorded. And um, Benny King and a lot of disco stuff. And then there was, uh, we moved, I moved to a, we built a new studio called Power Station in 77. And uh, I was the kind of the ch head, chief engineer, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. and uh, helped design the place. And that turned into like the biggest, most popular studio, probably on the East Coast, I think. Wow. You know, and and um, so that was, that was quite successful. And, you know, then I started producing I worked with the Rolling Stones. I started producing people like Brian Adams mm -hmm. and uh, Simple Minds and The Pretenders and um, <clears throat> stuff like that. Uh, and then I, the, the main thing is that I got to know, I'm not sure how I got to know David Foster. I think he was friends with Brian Adams, who was one of my best friends because we I co-produced four albums with Brian. I know, I know that I think they're both from Vancouver. I, I mm -hmm. believe David was from Vancouver as well. So I'd met him a few times. Uh, I didn't know him very well. And um, the course thing came along. They, I mean, I'm sure you know the story about them sitting in the uh, the lobby. I think it was the Hit Factory or some studio. Correct. Yeah, it was Hit Factory. Yeah, and, until they David Foster came in and then they just hassled him until <laughs> he finally listened to what they were doing and he went wow and he was impressed but so david called me i hadn't actually worked with david we were just friends i knew him so this was the first project that you'd have this is really the first thing i believe i could be wrong but i might have mixed something for him somewhere along the line it's possible that i did i, I, mm. I can't really remember but you know he calls me up and he says listen i got something that i think you'd be interested in and i'd really like you to to listen to this. I mean, he didn't even say, 
I want you, an album I want you to mix. Anything you just you should you should hear this band. Wow. I went, well, that's fascinating. Okay, so come up to my place in Malibu, to his studio in Malibu. And so that's a nice drive up the coast, you know, it's into that. And and uh, so I sit down in his studio and th this is the, the fun part is that I don't know what I'm in for. I don't, I don't know what, you know, why am I sitting in this control room? Is he gonna play me a, a, some demos or something? What, what's going on? And then these, absolutely stunning women walk into the control room and one of them's holding a penny whistle one of them's holding a, a fiddle and uh and then and these these are the the core's sisters you know and then and then the brother comes in right and they all come in i go okay well this is fascinating <laughs> what's gonna happen and then they start playing songs just wow. live just with accompanying themselves I think uh, Jim was playing acoustic guitar mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, I was just, it completely blew my mind. I mean, I got to tell you, wow. uh, I was just in shock. I was like, oh my God, these people are, are first of all, they're stunning people oh. <laughs> and, and they're so massively talented. It was so obvious. And, and these were songs that they had written themselves. And uh, I, I was like, I didn't know what to think. And, and so I said, well, what, what, what do you want for me? He said, well, we'd like you to, we're doing a record and we'd like you to mix it. Wow. I said, well, I'm so in, you know, absolutely. <laughs> Just I'm, like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. There was absolutely no question whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, wow. And uh, I was just so thrilled and, and honored that the, this amazingly talented group of people that who I'd never heard of, mm you know, actually wanted me to be involved in their project, you know, and, and uh, I was so grateful to, to David as well to, for bringing me in. Cause I'm sure those guys didn't know. I don't think, I don't know if they knew who I was at all. There was definitely an edge in that time of kind um, naivety and, mm -hmm. and going along with the ride and for the ride because their, their manager, John Hughes, was, you know, that protective person who had good experience of the music industry and was putting them in places. So it was kind of, they were very much in his care. Yeah. The, the leaps and bounds and the people they were then finding themselves rubbing shoulders with and working with mm -hmm. were world class. And you're yeah. certainly part of that. No, thank and you. <laughs> it's, that. it's, yeah, do. <laughs> uh, and it's in incredible for them to look back from from interviews I've listened to and um, Andrea's memoirs and stuff, and for them to that now realize how far they came in such a little amount of time, on the ability to have that raw talent that everybody yeah. then seemed to want to to utilize and be a part of and and explore and enjoy together. So, yeah, it's what a what an amazing story you've told of that that first meeting. So, was there a kind of like a small introduction hi where where the calls or was it just they came out playing when you got there? Uh, no, there, there was an introduction. David introduced me to them, you know, told me who, who they were and, you know, they were all one family and, uh, and that they were, you know, an Irish family. Mm. And, uh, and, and then he just let me listen. I mean, I, I don't think he, he didn't hype them up or anything. No. I mean, it, it was just this sort of, okay, just listen, listen to this and tell me what you think. And of course it is. I don't remember which, which songs they played specifically, but you know, it was, it was impressive. I mean, I was so happy that, that David thought of me to, to do it. Cause you know, there's a lot of mixers and there's a lot of engineers, especially in this town, <laughs> Los Angeles, you know, to pick from. And uh, I was quite honored that he, he, that he or they, I don't know whose, yeah, whose yeah. decision it was, but that they asked me to, to be involved, you know, just amazing. It's it, it, yeah. I had a a lovely time talking with with so many, but specifically uh, Ryan Freeland. Oh yeah. Um, who talked at length uh, of what it was like to be in the studio alongside you in those mixes, yeah. and just the richness of how generous you were in giving of your time and allowing him to learn came across so lovely in his interview. It was beautiful. It really That's was. It. Well, Ryan was funny because, you know, the there'd be a, a doorbell, right? And so there, and 
obviously it's them at the door and he and ryan would like hop up and run upstairs and to answer the door you know <laughs> he was he was so into it and uh yeah, that really came across in his interview. It really did. The, just the love yeah. for that period of his life, let alone the love for that album specifically that, to get to work on, was one of huge joy for him. Mm. So it was really nice, and that came really came across in the interview. Going back to previous interviews, um, and you said you were obviously you were there. They were playing the music. You were like, yep, I, I want to do this. That's decided. But I spoke previously with Simon Phillips, who obviously lent drums to two tracks. That's right. Um, that, which, which is my uh, is my idea to get him because of the particular song uh, what was the, it was a really up tempo. Uh, uh, Toss the feathers was the track that he first. Yeah, played. toss. That's right. Toss the feathers, and and I said, look, the the guy for this is Simon Phillips for sure, because I just had that that sort of very fast shuffly feel that that I know he he is just so good at that kind of thing and was it that you'd heard a demo of toss the feathers um I think I just heard a rough mix yeah yeah because they had recorded it they'd done it with a, a drum machine or something or... yeah Simon Franklin on the sound clivia had programmed a a sort of a rough drum track from what I've seen. yeah right that's what it was yeah um right and then you were then tasked with setting up all the mics for recording the drum session for Simon. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I believe we did at the record plant in Hollywood. And because um, I didn't have a studio at that point. Now I now I do. I would have done it at my own studio if it was now. We set him up and um, I think he had some of his own mics, actually, if I remember nice. correctly. But uh, yeah, and I, I was just excited to work with Simon because the, the only time I had worked with him was on the Pretenders record that... Mm -hmm that we got him to do a couple tracks. And I just, I just, he's such a good guy, first of all, and so easy to work with. And, and, uh, and it just worked out so well. I mean, everybody was happy with what, what he did. And he seemed to have a great time. Did you talk to him about, did you talk to Simon? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was episode one. He was the first right. person I approached. Um, right. Just, yeah, he, he really, he said, you know, it was, the session was, was short, he yeah, wanted to right. do more because of how fun it was. Um, David Wright has uh, had some handy cam footage of him doing takes and drum rolls mm -hmm. and stuff and then coming back to the desk to discuss it with David and the band. And it was just lovely to see that insight of him going back and forth and the, the real wow moments of him doing those kicks and those fills live on camera was just phenomenal. Um, yeah. So yeah, you chose rightly. <laughs> you yeah. definitely chose rightly there. Was it a case that you recommended it and David was just, oh, well, let's go on, go along with that. Or would, would it have been David knew him at that time as well? Jeez, I don't, I don't know if he knew him or not, but, uh, okay. I know everybody, when I mentioned his name, everybody said, yeah, okay, great. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. The footage shows that he played on Toss the Feathers, but also mm -hmm. on a track called, I don't know. Right. I don't know was a very early demo for the cause. Mm -hmm. Um, it was actually on the the first cassette tape given to Jason Flom when yeah. they a appeared in the A and R office for Atlantic before mm -hmm. the meeting with David, and that fateful day where they came and played for him. But it was never used on the final album, even though Simon recorded drums for it. And I didn't know. I wanted to ask you directly whether or not it ever got to mixing stage. Good question. Yeah, and... I, I don't remember. I mean, it could have. I just, I just don't don't remember. I mean, I. I might be able to look it up. Uh, what, what was the name of that? It's called I Don't Know. Hang on one sec. I'll just do a quick search. Sure. Oh, wait, the chorus. Yeah, here it is. Yeah, I did a mix. No way. Uh, I wonder if I have it someplace. <laughs>
list of the songs. Oh, perfect. Given Not Forgotten. That was, that was the first album, right? Heaven Knows, Correct. Yeah. Leave Me Alone, Closer, Love to You, oh, no. and then I Don't Know is one of those. Oh, wow. And then Mix 19. Wow, geez. <laughs> I, spent no, I, don't, I Don't Know had 19 mixes. Well, 19, it's the way it works is the, the in the computer is there weren't really 19 to tape. No. You know, it was just uh, 19 passes in the computer, but it, it means I spent I spent a long time on it. <laughs> I probably wow. spent a full full day. What other tracks do you have there for that album? Well, let's see. Forgiven Not Forgotten, Heaven Knows, Love Me Alone, Closer, mm-hmm. uh, Love to Love You, Law, Law Fair and Shore. Yep. Um, Secret life rainy day runaway um toss feather feathers mm-hmm. uh, i don't know in right time yeah i don't know has never been never been recorded since then the, the tracks you illustrate the ones i've got here listed there's i believe they're mixed by you are uh forgive not forgotten heaven knows someday runaway the right time love to love you secret life closer leave me alone rainy day and then one you didn't list because I didn't know if you'd find you'd actually mixed it is the what was finally used on as the um, Japanese bonus track, um, which was called "Somebody Else's Boyfriend." Uh, I don't have that listed here. No, no. And it sounds very different as well. So I'm wondering if it was mixed by somebody else. Probably, probably is. They don't remember that title. Do you have any recollections of mixing specific tracks? I really don't. <laughs> it's it's it is as it's as a whole, I guess. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, and I'd say that about you, you, almost everything I've ever done. Yeah. You know, I, people ask me all that. Oh, what did you do on this particular mix? And Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> I made it sound good. <laughs> <clears throat> I, yeah, I tried to make it sound good, and uh, I mean, I've mixed thousands and thousands of records, and so <laughs> it's really tough <laughs> is there anything specifically about the cause record that you had in mind when mixing that you can remember just, i mean it's just what what i always do is i try to make it I, i'd listen to the songs you know and uh and and try to make the mix reflect something about the the songs and the environment of the mix or just just generally like this mix i'm i'm doing i'm doing something for this french artist and uh and the lyric is about floating through space. And so I tried to make it, you know, like the lo- make it sound like the loneliness of space, you know, and I got the, this very small little mono reverb and things like that. And so, you know, that, that's just a, an idea of, you know, you hear a song and, you, and okay, you try to imagine what it is and where, where it is, or, you know, not, not literally where it is, but, mm. Um, just sort of figuratively and conceptually and and uh, you try to get come up with some kind of something that matches as far as mix mix wise as far as the environment of it you know that that's what I would do with them and that's kind of what I do with everybody you know <laughs> set you in good stead <laughs> yes yeah, set you in good stead and it's it's more than just pushing buttons and having a good ear it's creative in oh, a yeah. way isn't it it's creative yeah well it, it isn't just pushing buttons you know you, you the pushing the button you know what the buttons do to match your the Im- imagination of what, mm. what you know how you imagine the thing should be you know it's good to know what each button does <laughs> yeah. yeah but sure. then that's just in the background <laughs> yeah that's that's muscle memory then um it's yeah like- and it's fun it's funny because i always have, have trouble with producers and engineers that that seem to be more concerned with the the gear than the music sometimes you know what i mean and that you know, I ran into this this producer, and I won't say who he was. No. And uh, I was mixing a live show or something, and and this guy just was going on and on about, oh, do you have such and such a plugin, and do you use this reverb, or do you use it? And I go, dude, man. Uh, first of all, I don't think that way, and I, I, yeah, I don't. Maybe I do. I don't know. You know, I don't really think about the gear that much. I think about the music, and I. And and I'll I'll get whatever I I don't really worry about the you know my gear is no different than anybody else's and I don't have that much anyway 
but you you use what you what works and if it gets the final result as, of what you want then you got the right thing but i, I don't I certainly don't obsess about it <laughs> for the mixing itself how involved were the band at that process or was it a case of you were given part of an album or a song by song to mix or was it were you given the whole thing oh well, it would be a song by song yeah and um but they were here i mean they they were here and they would they would come they would certainly comment i mean usually how it works is i'll i'll put a mix together and they'll play it for them and then they go okay yeah that was great only uh you know the penny whistle in the second verse is a little too loud or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. And uh, that kind of thing. I can't remember any specific things that no. comments that they, they made, but they were certainly uh, involved in it for nice. sure. Wow. You know? And I think David, David was sort of in, in and out, you know, he, cause he was always busy with a million other things. And so he would stop by and listen and, and make a comment or two, but mostly he let, he let the band, deal with it you know and um and jim was pretty pretty strong had pretty strong opinions about things if i remember correctly yeah i think that ring resonates very very clearly through the different interviews um so yeah. far for the series um just yeah the amount of um input he had is i guess that's why he's assistant producer he's got yeah. a production credit on the record for that very oh reason. absolutely yeah. he was absolutely a producer for sure you know, wow. Wow. and just a brilliant guy too. I mean, he, oh, every, I usually, I would agree with, you know, if it was something that I, I didn't, I wouldn't have thought of, you know, I'd, I'd try his suggestion and go, oh, well, that makes it, that, that works. Cause he knows the music so well mm. and he was usually right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, that's lovely to know, even, uh, yeah. even in the mixing level. Um, yeah. Uh, that 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 there was involvement. Do you know? Can you recall the period of time that the mixing took? She, I don't. I don't think I ever. I certainly never spent more than a day on a mix. But you, you, usually, I, I'd get maybe one to two mixes a day. Mm -hmm. I guess you know I have the luxury of having my own my own studio, so I could leave stuff up overnight. A lot of times, yeah. I'll mix one song and I'll finish it, and then start the next song. And I think this is pretty much how it went with those guys. And uh, and then the second one, I just leave up overnight and we listen in the morning yeah. with fresh ears, yeah. you know, do a couple of little touch ups and then print it and then move on to the next one. That wow. kind of thing. You know, it is a real luxury to mm. have your own room where you don't have to, because where I worked in the power station in New York, they had two sessions a day in each room. And so if you had the day session, like on the Let's Dance album for Bowie, We'd, we'd have to finish up at 6.30 or 7 o'clock. Then you have to change the room over for the night session. Wow. You, know? you have to mark where everything was so that you could put it put it well, back. To so it's, yeah, to, to a point, you know. Um, usually I just start it fresh the next day. and uh, But yeah, for recording tracks, I think we would mark everything. And, uh, and I think, well, for that album, uh, I'm trying to think. I think the console was in SSL so we could reset it. <laughs> it was also long ago. <laughs> And just listening back to the Unplugged album is an incredible joy for many fans. I know many will be listening who adore the the recording of, of Unplugged. And it's just a huge time capsule for many of us for the historic success of the band. Obviously, you've worked on other albums other than 
uh, forgive not forgotten for for the cause it's talk on corners and yeah. unplugged correct right do you recall why you were asked to do unplugged was it just a, a natural following on from your work on the first two albums or i, th- I think it was i, I think they yeah. just thought they they trusted me you know after mixing two records that were quite successful they it's time to do a a, a live album and said oh yeah let's let's um put it in clear mountains hands <laughs> and hopefully you won't screw it up <laughs> you certainly didn't it's beautiful yeah no that was that was a that was a great experience it was it was so nice after working with them in the studio to hear them and actually see them live because i mix it to picture oh. and um, you know and so it was it was nice to have that that experience i guess that was in many ways a, a coming of age moment comparable to the first time you saw them play in that oh yeah with david uh, for sure you've been mixing the audio to them them doing their thing um in front of more of an more of an audience than just me yes <laughs> <laughs> you had the the taste and the flavor and now the the full thing you're putting your stamp on for the world which is yeah beautiful absolutely beautiful though i mean they were just uh, they're just wonderful people and they were great to work with you know and so that's always what what I think. Like I like, I mean, nowadays it's unfortunate that everything's done online so much, and people don't really come to the studio as much as they used to. And I always like to get the personal input. You know, I like having them sitting here and commenting and discussing the mm-hmm. mix or discussing the um, the music, which does, just doesn't happen as much anymore. And that was great about back then with them; they were actually here and. And it was more of a collaboration mm. than just, oh, here, let this guy mix it. Yeah, you've done this, this, and this. I, those sound good, so he must be all right with this next one. The, right. <laughs> yeah, the, the artist's involvement in that that create, still creative part of the whole process is important. Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important to me. And especially in that record where it was, you know, obviously they're the common element. So mm. it was important for them to get the, for, for me to get their input in, into it and to help sort of sort through it. A lot of albums, and I'm a big fan of spatial audio. Would you be approached by the label to potentially mix into spatial audio for any cause content? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I have a full Atmos yeah. mix room now. And so, yeah, I would love to do that. Yeah, to, I think that would be... Take those mixes and, um, and either recall them. I would probably just do it over from scratch, though, and just... Mm-hmm just for fun <laughs> it'd be more yeah, fun yeah, for me yeah. than to, to have to recall and, and uh, reset everything the way I had. I mean, my, my gear has changed quite a bit now. And so I wouldn't, it'd be better if I just did it from scratch and then do proper Atmos mixes, you know, mm. I hope they ask. That'd be great. Yeah. And I just, I just wondered how that process would work. Cause I mean, seemingly if almost any sort of recognizable album is, is starting to get the, um, that type of spatial audio mix um yeah so of any of any of any quality or standing and i think that album certainly deserves it is there anything else that you thought i would ask or that comes to mind well okay here's a question why why haven't they asked me to mix any more records (laughs) that that is that that is a very good question that i will no doubt get the chance to put to them so and i'll probably use that that segment that section with you just saying that um, I'm still here <laughs> and I miss them. Please tell them that. <laughs> I, I definitely will. I definitely will. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's about time. I think it's about time for, for that difference to be made. And right. what, what, how amazing it would be sort of 27 to 30 years later, suddenly coming full circle and maybe something a bit more traditional onto their roots and raw and then having yeah. you involved would be yeah definitely appreciated by the band i'm sure and the well be appreciated by me as well <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh for taking the time today um and for agreeing to be on it was lovely to hear the recollections of mixing such a an now iconic album it's been great to chat and thank you very much all right well thank you it's been a pleasure speaking to you great talking to you. okay take care thank you so much bye. you too A huge thanks again to Bob for his time, and especially his trust. After hearing about Causecast, he decided to entrust the original DAT tapes for the mixes of the album 
into my hands. This in turn has allowed me to share with you all um, glimpses of clips here and there throughout the episodes, as well as, as you've heard, the elusive track, I Don't Know, which he obviously worked on years prior. The journey of being able to listen to the original DAT tapes is probably one I should tell. After realising that they were still in his possession uh, and that they may contain audio that was yet unheard, it was then the, the journey of being able to get DAT tapes, if they worked at all, converted to something that you could all listen to. DAT tapes are very much like mini cassette tapes. Um, for those of you that don't know, with digital audio tape, um, the audio is written digitally with ones and zeros to the actual tape. So I could have found a, uh, a machine that played DAT, plugged some a microphone near it, etc., um, and had some kind of at least a quality of, of performance from the tape if it at all worked. Um, I wanted to go one step further because I felt that I was preserving music history and preserving something from the band that we simply hadn't heard before. So I decided to go to the most extreme level possible and find a way of extracting digitally the zeros and ones that made up the audio on the tape itself. Uh, After a lot of research, um, I ended up driving uh, around about three and a half hours to a gentleman in the middle of here in the UK um, who had a backup drive facility um, that was specifically made for this type of work. Um, after a long conversation about actually what I had in my hands, uh, having you know original final mixing tapes from Bob Clearmountain himself that I wanted to archive, we set to work and amazingly, every tape worked 100% without any errors whatsoever. And we were able to archive a complete exact replica of each of the digital files into a more modern format. So what you've heard and what you will hear throughout the season and the series will be as good as it gets. It's really hard to convey how exciting and exhilarating it was to receive a parcel after a few weeks of waiting and watching the tracking seemingly every hour being refreshed by myself and having to go and pick it up from the local depot to open this parcel and have it contain the original master dat tapes of an album we've now been discussing and celebrating for almost a year. Um, After listening and hearing from so many of its incredible contributors over this last year, it was surreal to finally have a part of that music history in my hands and to realise within these tapes were not only edits and mixes that have never been heard, but an entire track that had never been heard by fans, all of these some 27 years later. And to finally come home after having them converted after that long drive to um, an audio CD, pressing play, sitting back and hearing unheard content from the cores from that era was just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. And it is such a joy for me to be able to share some of this with you um, so you too can enjoy and um, love yet more of something we haven't yet heard. After multiple requests of several episodes, uh, I can now announce that Causecast is now available via YouTube. Uh, A few people didn't have particular podcasting platforms or software that they liked very much, but they were a big fan of YouTube. So I decided to take the plunge and upload the episodes to YouTube for your viewing and listening pleasure. Uh, Any feedback, subscriptions, likes, comments, all of that good stuff would be obviously welcome over on YouTube. Links to each of the episodes, as well as show notes for each episode, can obviously be found on causecast.com. I'd like to also mention at this point um, how wonderful it is to see the community on Discord growing. 
It's lovely to have those of you that have joined there to discuss the content that we have in the episodes, the songs, and the band in general. You'll find a link in the show notes if you also wish to connect with others on Discord and discuss, have Discord, and chat regarding the band. Again, I'd like to express my thanks for those that have reviewed the podcast on Apple Music. It really helps and it's lovely to see all those five-star reviews and people's honest feedback and joy in being able to listen to the episode so far. If you have time, I would obviously again encourage you to leave a review and thank you so much to those who have already. Thank you for listening and until next time, you've been listening to Causecast. Causecast.